Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan, and yes, I'm back home from Poland. This trip I made over there to see what was going on in the world to volunteer couldn't have been possible without all you guys and this channel. It allows me to basically travel wherever I wanna go, and uh, I am deeply grateful for all of your support. Star Wars can be consumed at many different levels. There are those fans who take the story at face value. There are those who go for escapism. Then there are those who focus on individual elements of Star Wars, like the fashion or culture, the ships, the music. And of course, for us generation tech fans, the geopolitics and military strategy. Today, we're gonna to take a closer look at the Clone Wars and the composition of both the Grand Army of the Republic and the Confederacy of independent systems. We're gonna take a look at the military philosophy of both organizations and why one is far superior to the other. When they created the clones from Django Fett's DNA, they tried to tweak the clone genetic material somewhat to make them more docile and more ready to follow orders. They tried to remove the excessive aggression and lone wolf mentality that made Django Fett a bit too dangerous and individualistic to serve in a military force. But still, they were only dampening something that was essential to Django Fett's personality and to the personality of any human being. So despite being clones, the troopers of the Republic were individuals, especially the clone commando units and ARC troopers who quickly adopted the culture of individuals training them, whether they were from Mandalore, Corellia, or Concord Dawn. It became apparent pretty early on that clones had a very strong self-identity. This could be seen in the Clone War series where many clones would adopt different color armor, different hairstyles, and tattoos. And for the most part, the Jedi commanders encouraged this type of behavior. Not only because they ironically believed in self-determination, but because it made the clones better fighters. Their individual identity gave them more confidence, and more confidence leads to more initiative on the battlefield. And so when your commanding officer or droid control ship gets knocked out, these enlisted men don't just stop moving. They can keep fighting without an issue because that's what they're trained to do. Every clone trooper is a one-man army. As an army for a republic, the clones were supposed to be modeled after the militaries of more advanced democratic nations with a free market economy. Generally, these type of countries will field a professional army with a very strong NCO corps or non-commissioned officer corps. In most military forces, you have your enlisted grunts or conscripts. These are very low ranking individuals and they do the fighting on the ground. These are the unmarked clone troopers in the white armor. Most military forces also will have an officer corps. These are your commanders. They go to special schools for military education and they are the individuals who go to the briefings and have a better understanding of the overall battle plan and how their small piece of the battlefield fits into the larger battle plan. In the clone army, this is basically individuals like Commander Cody or one of the many Jedi commanders. Now, NCOs or non-commissioned officers are sort of like a mixture of both. These are usually older enlisted men who through service and battlefield experience have learned enough to take command of smaller units on the battlefield. Now, they don't have that more formal training and education that a commissioned officer will have, but they are an integral part of the force and help bridge the gap between the officers and enlisted men. In the clone army, we don't have as many non-coms. Instead, we have individuals like Captain Rex, who despite being an officer, actually fits the role of a non-com much better. And that's because Star Wars isn't really a realistic military sim, so for the purposes of this video, let's just call Captain Rex a non-com and use him as an example. Let's take a look at what Captain Rex does on the battlefield and why non-coms like him are so important. Remember this idea of bridging the gap between officers and enlisted men? Well, oftentimes these two groups have extremely different backgrounds, both from a military standpoint, but also from a social and economic standpoint. Historically speaking, officers generally are more educated and they also come from a more privileged background. This was definitely the case back in the day during the Great Wars. This is definitely the case during the Clone Wars, where you have Jedi officers commanding background clone troopers. It was also common for junior officers like a second lieutenant fresh out of officer school to have much less experience than the enlisted men they were commanding. The Jedi commanders during the Battle of Geonosis clearly had no idea what they were doing and led their men straight into disastrous frontal charges. This probably would not have happened if the clone army at the time had a strong NCO core already developed, which they kind of did. But unfortunately, these NCOs were basically introduced to their officers moments before the battle started, and so they never developed the relationship and trust that you usually want in a well-oiled fighting machine. 
And that's because NCOs serve as kind of a mediator between the enlisted men and the commissioned officers, especially commissioned officers with very little battlefield experience. Um, an NCO can protect the enlisted men from bad orders from above, and an NCO can protect an officer from uh, attempts from mutiny from below. Such was the case when General Pongrell took over the 501st. If it weren't for Captain Rex's mediation, I think the general would have accidentally been hit by a friendly mortar or run over by a walker. At the same time, Captain Rex was able to protect his men somewhat from General Krell Pong's worse orders. The smartest junior officers, the ones that survived the longest, usually heavily rely on their NCOs, especially during that first initial training phase when they enter combat. Also, these sergeants not only know what they're doing on the battlefield, they also train, discipline, and take care of the needs of the enlisted men. And so they are like a parental figure in a way as well, and very important for unit morale. Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano developed a great bond with Captain Rex, which is ultimately why his unit in the 501st was so deadly. Now these non-coms aren't just mediators and caretakers, of course, they are also combat leaders, usually very excellent combat leaders. They generally will lead smaller units at the squad level, which means a force with NCOs and its backbone can break up into much smaller pieces and therefore carry out much more complicated maneuvers that require multiple avenues of approach. Also, if there are casualties amongst junior officers, which unfortunately are quite common in conventional battles, they are basically the prime target for marksmen on the opposing side, a NCO can usually step up and take over command of that larger force. Take a look at the Battle of Rishi Moon Outpost. Rishi Moon was located on the only approach to the planet of Kamino, arguably the most important planet for the GAR. It's where the main breeding and training area for the clone army was located. A small squad of soldiers were stationed on a hidden listening post on the moon. They were led by the clone Sergeant O-Niner. When the Confederacy sent a squad of commando droids to take out the listening post, they quickly took out almost half of the unit, including Sergeant O-Niner, the commanding officer. Luckily in the GAR, even the lowly troopers trained to take over in an emergency, because the command structure of such clone squads could be broken down into smaller fire teams who were expected to operate independently in the first place. The remaining clones don't just give up or stand and fight in their position their sergeant last commanded them to. This is the type of behavior you usually expect from droids. Instead, these clones take the initiative and make a tactical retreat and regroup outside the listening post and reassess the situation. It's at this point they manage to warn two officers coming to Rishi Moon for inspection that something was amiss. They ultimately join up with these more experienced officers and eventually retake the base long enough to alert the Republic fleet. And so as you can see, the clone army was expertly crafted to be very flexible and mobile in any battlefield situation. This is how the GAR was able to pull off extremely complicated battle plans, like the one carried out by the Galactic Republic during the Second Battle of Geonosis. This was a massive invasion that involved several different battalions of clone troopers and their equipment that needed to be ferried down to the surface from carriers and destroyers. There were multiple landing points that were all heavily guarded and required perfect coordination and timing along with an ample amount of air support and orbital bombardment for success. Each one of these landing points were heavily guarded and all three attack vectors needed to land precisely at the same time in order to protect each other's flanks from the inevitable Korean Ocean counterattack. Since this was an assault landing, the JR primarily was using light infantry supported with a small number of armored vehicles. And like in most battles, the intel was off. The anti-air defenses around the landing zone were far more robust than expected, and none of the three attack prongs even made it close to their initial landing zones. Many gunships were shot down or forced down and scattered across the battlefield. Luckily, the JR was built for these type of missions, and their decentralized command structure meant that every NCO, every clone corporal who survived their landing was able to regroup with other small units and push onto their objectives. This is very reminiscent of the drops that the 101st and 82nd Airborne did the night before D-Day. Very few of these individuals landed in the right place as well, but small ad hoc fire teams were created on the run, oftentimes with units from completely different divisions, and they managed to create enough chaos behind enemy lines that German reinforcements were unable to counterattack the exposed Allied forces assaulting the beach the next day. It shouldn't be surprising, though, that democracies have always created military forces that mirrored the mentality and ideology of their society and people. What makes a democracy so powerful is the amount of trust placed in the individual instead of the state or the executive position. And so freedom of information is extremely important in these type of systems. This way the individual can properly assess the situation and know how they should act. It takes great courage and strength from the leadership to practice that on a nationwide level. 
But ultimately, if these systems are properly created and maintained and stable, they are far more efficient than an authoritarian regime, which spends far too much energy and time on impressing individuals instead of doing what they should be doing, which is governing. So why do authoritarian military forces usually skip over the creation of the NCO class? It's ultimately because authoritarian governments are designed not to share power or even information with the people. Because unlike in democratic systems where the people in power are continuously rotated out of power, authoritarian governments are designed to maintain the power of one individual or one ruling class and party. In order for this to happen, they need to have tight control over all the major institutions of the nation. So this means a planned economy, a state-controlled education system and media, a robust intelligence service to watch over everything, and of course, a military not loyal to the people, but to the regime. The Confederacy of Independent Systems' uh, solution to creating a loyal military was very simple. They basically employed a massive, unthinking army of separatist droids. These were to be commanded by tactical droids and separatist generals that were either ideologically aligned with the CIS and Count Dooku, or mercenaries who were paid extremely well to fight for the CIS. So this is a pretty simple situation. As long as the leaders in charge of these units were well taken care of, then the droids would be loyal to the cause as well. You don't have to care so much about the welfare or needs of the individual droids, which is very required in a democratic military force. If we take a look at the recent invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation, a quick look at their military doctrine showcases a military force that has failed to create a professional NCO corps. Despite all of the Russian propaganda we've seen in the years leading up to the war, Putin's military is kind of a paper bear. Things have remained relatively unchanged from the Soviet era. This is a military force that still heavily relies on conscript forces who were given minimal training and then return to civilian life and wait to be called upon again. Conscripts have low morale. They're not really effective fighting forces and they usually do well only in static defensive positions. On top of that, Russia's economy, which is smaller than France, Italy, South Korea, and even Canada's, and, and that's before the recent sanctions, can't possibly maintain a massive military force that is also high quality. And now, as we've seen from Russian telegram channels, many of these conscripts were sent into battle with broken weapons, rations that have expired almost 10 years ago, and many of these conscripts don't even know where they are. Some of them believe that they're still in a military exercise in Russia. What's horrific about these situations more than anything is that Putin is willing to treat his own soldiers essentially like battle droids. Morale is extremely low amongst the Russian forces and casualties are extremely high. It's estimated that in the first two weeks alone, Russian forces lost more troops than they did in 10 years in Afghanistan. The most recent estimates now seem to indicate that Russia's entire attacking force has lost 25% of its capability. And because only a percentage of the entire Russian attacking force are combat units, this means that the Russian forces are effectively no longer able to operate. Which is why Putin is desperately trying to recruit economically vulnerable Syrians to join his fight with the promises of cash payout. So let this be a warning to other authoritarian regimes in the world who are seeking to invade other countries and take over with their military might. And that's because a military force's power is not calculated by sheer numbers, tanks, airplanes. It's calculated by the heart of the soldier. As we've seen in Ukraine, a free individual willing to fight to the death for his home is easily worth at least 10 or 20 conscripts from an oppressed regime. So there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the republic, to democracy.